Hi, welcome everyone to Virtually Incorrect. I am Gunter, your host tonight, and for those new, Virtually Incorrect is a weekly panel discussion show about virtual reality in virtual reality. Topics that are interesting to the VR community will be semi-seriously discussed with the panel each week with nothing off-limits and nothing censored. Before we introduce our guests, I want to thank the fantastic RiffMax crew for producing and editing the show, as well as my amazing guests, the folks in the RiffMax audience, and everyone watching via the Hitbox stream or YouTube. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Holotape in the audience tonight. He helped me gather stories and topics this week, so it's been a huge uh, help. Thanks, man. And we have a great panel of VR developers, personalities, and enthusiasts here with us tonight. So let's go ahead and meet him. On my right, I've got E. McNeil, developer of Darknet, winner of the 2003 VR Game Jam. E, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. And uh, on my right as well, uh, filling in for, I hope I'm saying his name right, Akrima, uh, who is one of the developers uh, with Kite and Lightning. Um, unfortunately, he uh, had some difficulties getting him in the theater tonight, but we'll have him on a uh, show in the future. So filling in for him is uh, Deep Rifter, a VR enthusiast and a karaoke aficionado, and that's uh, karaoke in Riffmax. So thanks for joining, Deep Rifter. Thanks, Gun. Shout out to the boys in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Salt Lake. That's right. SLC. All right. Uh, we also have here on left uh, Flake, VR enthusiast and YouTuber with uh, the virtual reality guinea, guinea pig channel. Oh, Flake. What's up? Thanks. What's up? Thank you. And finally, we have Jake in the margin, computer science student at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Jake's research includes robotics and AI. Welcome, Jake. And before we kick off the first story, I want to announce a Hitbox poll for the show. Uh, the question is, if Samsung came out with an Android base HMD, would you buy it? And we'll share the results at the end of the show. So it's now time to dive into the VR discussion portion. Uh, panelists, are you ready? Yep. Yep. Excellent. So the first story is the future of Oculus. And this is posted by Tim Code. Tim Kochiki, 111. And in uh, his post, uh, he asked subreddit uh, what they saw for the future of Oculus. And he also said, at the rate of Oculus is going, they will perfect the ordinary HMD in a few years, especially with the deep pockets of Facebook. So his question is, what will they do next? Where do you see Oculus and VR in the next five years, 25 years? I want to go ahead and start it off with uh, Deep Rifter. Well, I want to answer uh, the, what you were saying about Oculus. Where are they going to be down the road? I want to see Oculus. You know, these are the guys that need the stamp of, of approval, always pushing the edge, taking it to the next level. That's what I want to see Oculus always doing, you know, helping people out here and there. You know, you've got Samsung on board now, uh, working with Oculus. I want to see these guys as always cutting the edge. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, exactly. Let's get the opinion from Flake. Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's easy to push the edge when you see the acquisitions that they're making. I mean, every other day you see another uh, absolutely uh, like the best minds. It, they're just assembling the most killer team that, uh, I mean, it, it's sky's the limit with this crew. Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. E, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so I've read some research that suggests that people are, uh, they tend to overestimate the change that'll happen in one year and underestimate the change that'll happen in 10 years. And I don't think that's easy to correct for. I think it's almost unimaginable where things are going to be 10 years from now. But uh, in the near future, I think things are going to be, you know, pretty much what we expect them to be. Oculus is going to come out with a great, you know, head-mounted display and things are going to stay there for a while. There's going to be interesting research done and things like uh, you know, locomotion and motion controls and things like that. Um, but what we, you know, I think what's safe to be excited about is the Oculus Rift as it is being sold to us now. That's a great answer. Um, Jake, what do you think? You agree with that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> everybody pretty much summed it up. The, the future is pretty bright for Oculus. 
And I think, in particular, I'm particularly excited about Facebook because while people are skeptical, I think the the normalization there, but also the ability to bring everybody together and make it like this, where people interact socially through the Oculus, is what I'm most excited about. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, the, it's basically community. Oculus really has this great, you know, community kicking, which is why we are all here right now. And you know, my favorite part has absolutely been mm. the, the VR social side of things. Just want to read another uh, comment. Uh, this is by Everyday VR. Uh, he lists a few things. He said, uh, five twenty years, huh? Well, here's my wild speculation: uh, miniaturization of true accommodation using light field displays, fast, precise eye tracking for input and foveated rendering, ability to run as a high-performance, portable, self-contained system, and uh, VR input, starting with hand and finger tracking and eventually branching out into full-body tracking that can reproduce your complete pose, including face and fingers in VR. This, puts together, this put together with scanned avatars will enable lifelike VR social interactions. So that plays into exactly right what we're talking about with this social stuff. Who wants to chime in on Everyday's comment? Uh, I'll take this one. Um, so I uh, I saw a talk by Michael Abrash in which he was um, discussing positional tracking on the DK2. Abrash was talking about doing the Valve demo, and they were trying out a multiplayer um, test for something like this. And um, he discussed how when somebody else was putting on the Rift, you could sort of see it rise into the air and float around weirdly for a second, and then all of a sudden it was a person. You can tell that it's a human being um, underneath. Like, um, there, you know, there's also, like, uh, demonstrations where they just show motion capture points, and they're just, you know, a set of floating, you know, dots uh, on a screen. But if it's moving, you can tell that it's meant to be a human being, and it seems astonishingly lifelike, even if the graphics are terrible. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And I can totally just even imagine that and be like, yeah, that makes sense. If you see dots moving, you know, like humans, uh, that's, that's totally going to make me think like that. There's nothing that seems to be able to replicate that. And that makes me think of Doc Ock's video where he was using the like three connects and he was able to bring in his uh, own body and even that chair uh, into the scene. And um, it was really crude, of course, very jaggedy and missing parts, but you could basically get the idea and it was that um, you know, fluid movement of the body mattered more than like the high definition of what you looked like, the rendering of yourself. So interesting. Any other uh, thoughts on this topic? Well, just following that comment, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, we all recognize that moment, even even in this theater. I mean, for karaoke night or, or whatever, somebody gets in, spins around a couple times, trying to get their get their rift on, and all of a sudden, you know that there, there's somebody on the other side of it, and it's just such a a remarkable, powerful moment. And, and it's funny, even experiences like getting on for karaoke night, there's moments where you're about to sing a song and you're absolutely nervous. You know, it, 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 it's, it's so real. Uh, it's just, it, it's, so spe it's so special. It's very, very cool. I mean, obviously I, I could, you know, attest to that and we all could right now. I mean, uh, right now there's a show going on. There's, there's people watching, whether they're watching live uh, or they're in this audience or, again, on YouTube. So, uh, you know, when I'm prepping or this last hour before the show, I'm, you know, cramming everything in and, and kind of getting nervous and psyching myself up. So, I mean, this VR social stuff is very real, and it's definitely allowed me to step outside my boundaries. Other thoughts? Deep breath. Yeah, um, I, I, I think... Uh relatively soon once we really get the whole motion capture down we are if i were to meet for example one of you guys in real life after hanging out with your avatar even though your avatar doesn't look like you i think i might be able to identify you just based on your body motions and your character that way you know huh it's very interesting i never thought of it but you know going off ease you know comment there that could be completely, uh, you know, possible. Uh, you know, of course, we might recognize each other's, you know, voices and whatnot. And that did happen at SVBR, you know, last weekend. We had a bunch of our friends and 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 other guests that had been on the show that met up. And sometimes, you know, they people would just be hearing their name uh, or hearing their voice and be like, "Oh, aren't you Rev? Or aren't you so and so?" Uh, and but wouldn't it be interesting to recognize somebody from their, you know, your body language? Or as we of course get more, you know. Uh, um, high definition in our 
in our avatars here in our expression, that I think will definitely become the case. Interesting. You'd be able to recognize me because I'd be shooting laser pointers at everybody. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, any uh, thoughts? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that there'll be another moment of realization once there's realistic eye tracking as well. I feel like that's a massive part of this entire expressive suite. And once that eye tracking's there, there'll be another realization on the same level that, wow, that's a person. And it feels completely real. And eye tracking will have yeah. a very strong impact on that. Well, another thing that was uh, talked about, I think by Abrash in that same talk, is that they can, um, they can fake eye tracking. So even if they're not actually tracking your eye, if they make um, your avatar you know, look at the eyes of whoever you're, you're staring at, um, on the receiving end, that still feels very lifelike, even if it's not, you know, actually uh, accurate. Interesting. Uh, I, you know, obviously, um, I would love to see eye tracking, of course, being able to, you know, anything that furthers this, furthers the benefit of this show and what we're able to do and how we're able to communicate. So, uh, I know that High Fidelity was demonstrating this sort of situation at uh, SBBR and other places. Um, and what was, you know, is the puzzle still, though, is, uh, you know, how they're going to actually do that when somebody has an HMD on their head. Um, but I definitely liked what I saw when it was not an HMD and just really cool how, you know, it was reading the face and communicating that information. That's definitely something that I'm interested in want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to dive deeper into our guests' uh, background and ask some questions, uh, and we'll kind of do um, basically a couple stories, talk to a guest, a couple stories, talk to a guest, that sort of format. So uh, first up is E, um, E. McNeil, um, who uh, created uh, Cease uh, when it was known back in the VR Jam and is now uh, Darknet. Um, really awesome game, and I love it. Uh, if you could just go ahead and t tell, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, just a general introduction, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I will, I'm an indie developer. I'm working solo out of my home uh, apartment in San Diego. And I've been doing this for uh, a little over a year and a half now. Um, Darknet is by far the largest game that I've ever worked on. Um, and uh, yeah, the plan is to release it as a Oculus Rift launch title, um, whenever that may be. Excellent. Right on. Um, and we're keenly watching, you know, the Darknet dev blobs and wondering uh, blogs and wondering how things are, are coming along with, with the game and whatnot. Um, things are, you know, it's being built pretty quickly. Um, I'd say there are still some things that, um, you know, I'm wrestling with and uh, that maybe that's a good thing. Um, like there, there are some core systems that I really wished were, um, were sort of locked down, but um, I ultimately decided needed more attention. So like this past couple of weeks, I've been kind of you know, ripping out the uh, the wires and, and, you know, building something new. Um, and so, you know, it, it's kind of like I'm making great progress, but the goalposts kind of keep moving. Um, I'm trying to deliver something that I can really be proud of and that will provide, like, a really great early foundational experience in VR. Um, and, you know, that's that can be tough to pull off as, as one guy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, um indie developers got definitely a, a mountain to climb here um, and that's going to sort of tie into our next topics but before we go into those uh, I wanted to ask you do you feel that in the future uh, haptic gloves and full body tracking um, will be a, a place for games controlled by head movement um, well speaking to somebody who's playing around with some motion controls right now um, I think that they're very cool, and there are definitely going to be some places where they are um, better than you know than not having them. But uh, I think overall, I'm I'm cooler than most VR enthusiasts on the idea. Um, you know, like it's definitely going to be something that progresses. But I think it's um, it's sort of like that thing I was talking about earlier, where people tend to overestimate the change that'll happen in the near future. Um, I think it's it's all, it's so far away from the the level of quality that we're getting in the head-mounted displays that um, we should be seeing it as an unsolved problem. Like, the, the current state of motion controls is um, analogous to maybe where VR was, you know, in the last, uh, in the 90s, when, when that kind of caved in. Um, 
you know, maybe not so drastic, but it's got a long way to go, and it'll have its moment, but further in the future than people imagine. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big uh, believer that, you know, it's always going to take longer than you think it is, especially in software. Software is hard. Um, and so, you know, goalposts being realigned, uh, it's part of like the, it's part of agile development and you just need to do those things so you can get, you know, that quality product. So one last question, what's, uh, next for you once, uh, Darknet's finished? Any plans? Um, no plans yet. Darknet is probably not going to be finished, finished for a very long time. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know when it's going to be, you know, to need to be done, um, you know, it's whenever the Oculus Rift comes out. But if uh, if that turns out to be earlier than I expect, then I'm going to keep on developing it until you know and adding features after release. Um, and there, you know, it, it's going to depend on how the reception is. But um, it's going to be occupying my time for long enough that I haven't spared any thought for what comes after. Kind of thought maybe you would say that, but definitely wanted to ask that question. So uh, uh, thanks for. Um, answering those questions, that was great. Uh, next topic is Oculus collaborating with Samsung. This is posted by Frog Loggers. And uh, Gadget reported that Oculus and Samsung are working together on a media-focused HMD. Is mobile VR something that you would consider being uh, developed right now? Um, and Philly Pro uh, has a comment on this thread. Uh, Oculus gives Samsung early access to its mobile software development kit and helps develop user interface software while Samsung gives Oculus early access to its next-gen OLED screens. Holy shit, the perfect plan. What do you guys think about this, E? Um, I mean, it sounds like a, a sort of win-win to me. Um, you know, once you have a computer with a good screen on it, which is, to say, a phone, um, why not just attach the tracking? And, you know, that hopefully would be cheaper than a full HMD and computer. Um, you know, it, it seems like a good wireless solution, as long as you can get the, you know, the software running well enough on it. What about you, Deep Rifter? I think it's awesome. I mean, I want a device that I can take on a plane and strap in and watch a movie. You know, I want the multimedia, ex the whole media experience in virtual reality, and it's not always needing to be connected to the computer. You know, computers for the hardcore immersion, gaming, pushing it to the edge, but... I'm I'm digging this man. I was kind of, you know, I was I was blown away first when I heard Samsung announced that hey we're releasing a VR too. I'm like holy crap! If we weren't already over the tipping point already, now we definitely are. Uh, VR is going to happen, and uh, then to find out that this is going on uh, with Oculus and Samsung, that is amazing. I mean, we're in amazing time to be alive. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great to see these people collaborating for sure. And I wonder, I mean, are we going to be able to get like much more customized HMDs. Uh, the mobile stuff, I'm a big fan of. I'd like to have these mobile meetups and whatnot. But are we going to be able to get these curved screens or something? Is that what this might, you know, suggest? What do you think, Jake? So, you, you, uh, we should remember that Oculus owes its success to the mobile phone industry. So it's great to see that the mobile phone industry is realizing this is where the next... Um, technological sector is going to be and so it's really exciting to see that sort of take off like yeah it's like a symbiotic relationship uh very interesting and, and even stuff like you know we talk about predicting the future before and how we're going to be able to see these things 10 25 years down the line uh it obviously took stuff like the mobile phone industry and even kickstarter to uh have emerged before we really could get to this virtual reality state that we're in uh so, yeah, it's, it's interesting how everything's interconnected like that. Flake, you know, your thoughts? At this stage, and of course it's a very early stage in the game, uh, I'm a bit of a junkie for all things VR, to be totally honest. So, uh, you know, I absolutely want Samsung. I absolutely want Sony. I want it all. And who knows at the end of the day, many will come, many will go. And, uh, you know, we hope there will be some strong stuff standing but for now, I, I just I want to consume it all, and I'm stoked that there's going to be more competition, and uh, you know it, it's just better for for consumers, better for developers, better for all of us. Yeah, I'm same there with being a junkie for all, all these things, and uh, it's hard not to just agree with everybody and just want to try everything. 
thing along with everybody. Um, you know, sometimes it's a challenge to get uh, critical with some of these things. So to keep things uh, moving along and in, in uh, uh, line with Oculus, we have uh, Palmer Lucky. Uh, I think we're going to be the best for a long time. And this was posted by Retroid64. And there's a comment by Sorasan. Uh, and he says from the article, uh, I could be wrong, and I think that there's going to be give and take, but very few companies stay ahead of um, the whole time, especially when you work in product generations that are longer than a year or two. Um, and he goes on to say that um, Palmer uh, mentions that the mobile phone industry is an odd example where companies are going through an upgrade cycle of less than a year. Instead, Lucky predicts that VR will go through cycles similar to more reasonable industries, with the competition perhaps making gradual leaps over longer periods of time. Uh, sounds like CV1 and CV2 will be at least a year apart, or more likely 18 months to 3 years. Good for devs and strong software integration? What do you guys think? Jake? It's, it's really hard to say, because there's so many companies that want a piece of this pie. So, um, they, they do have the best minds in the company, uh, and they've taken on Michael Abrash and John Carmack, who have just, they've pioneered computer graphics, well, Carmack has pioneered computer graphics, Abrash operating systems, um, so they've got a lot of strong things, but at the same time, I think there'll be a, a lot of competition, and mm -hmm. that'll only push it forward mm -hmm. faster. Yeah, I agree with that. How about you, Deep Rifter? Uh, like Jake was saying, I mean, they, they look at the crew they've got there. They are going to be the best <laughs> for a long time. Uh, awesome crew. And uh, I'm kind of interested to see as the company develops what kind of side projects start happening, you know, what else they start working on as time goes on. I think they're going to start branching out in some interesting directions. That's my take on it. You mean like input devices or something even more down the rabbit input hole? Input devices, software, so input devices, software solutions. Uh, Lord knows what they're going to do with the multi-user space. I mean, that in itself is going to have some very interesting avenues in which they're going to tread down. Sure. I mean, just the fact that they talk about that they are actively building cyberspace or metaverse or some form of that is... It's just amazing to hear things like that. It's, you know, it's, we love it. Flake, your thoughts? I mean, on on the the whole idea of, of Oculus supremacy. I mean, it, it it's definitely not guaranteed. But I think that they're so well positioned right now. Uh, with like I said before, the team that they they've amassed is absolutely just an uh, I mean ridiculous team to say the least. So, uh, you know, if, if anybody can do it, and of course it doesn't hurt having the, the bankroll that they have behind them. So, I mean, at this point, if anyone's going to do it, it's going to be them. But, you know, in, in three years from now, the entire, uh, you know, concept, it, it could all change. But it'd be hard to argue what, what we think. Think I mean because we're big fans that uh, I mean Oculus we think is going to be the best but it is still you know could be up in the air but you know they they certainly uh, are making some amazing moves. E any thoughts on this topic? Um, I think in terms of uh, HMD supremacy, uh, it's going to be Oculus and maybe Sony for a good long while, um, which in the tech world means you know a few years maybe more. Right so. Uh, one more comment that I have here on the story uh, is from Everyday VR. Um, it says, I'm hoping uh, for something more like console generations uh, and a cycle like that. Most consoles don't really hit their stride and put out their best titles that really exploit the system until a couple years after they come out. We want Oculus investing more of their time in great content and less in shipping incremental new hardware. It's also good for consumers who don't have to upgrade all the time. And when he means console generations, he's talking three to four years, not like um, these new, these later eight-year kind of cycles that we've been seeing. Um, any thoughts on that, guys? Uh, I, I think he's got a good point there. Um, we need to see the software development keep up with the hardware. We, uh, it's just the way it is. You know, we're going to see the really awesome. Well, we're going to have some good launch titles. I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes we're not aware of, but. 
then we're going to see another wave come about a year into this where it's going there's going to be some awesome stuff coming down the pike every time we uh upgrade it well we see the cycle with the consoles right now and if i may i, I think it, it's all about supporting developers at the end of the day especially at this juncture it's about supporting developers uh, you know it'd be nice to see oculus step up really really support developers help them back them i mean at this stage there's so many indie developers uh you know that need some love and attention and you know it, it'll be nice when we start seeing you know cv1 cv2 sell in the millions but until then you're not going to have the, the the big shops producing titles, so we need you know to help push it along and to keep the interest going, to keep sales going of these HMDs. Oculus needs to start you know helping developers and backing them and investing in them. Uh, and I think that is actually happening. Maybe we're just not hearing about it, and maybe just people need to you know ask. And and E, you being the the our developer on the panel tonight. Maybe you could speak, or maybe you can't speak to, you know, any uh, help from Oculus or just, you know, uh, encouragement or, or what's your experience? Um, well, I I have signed an in, uh, an NDA, so there are things that I can't talk about. Um, but I, you know, I've I've spoken to other developers about this a fair amount, and, um, you know, I've I've heard some, you know, stories um, going both ways, you know, good stories and bad. But my personal experience has been um, excellent. Like I've gotten a lot of you know attention and support from their dev relations people, and you know they've they've been talking to me. And um, you know I think I was pretty lucky because of you know I started out with the um, the VR jam, and so part of you know the prize package for that was that I got to go visit Oculus and meet several of these people in person and sort of you know um, found those relationships I guess. Um, but it's it's only been a good experience for me so far. And let's move on. I wanted to talk to Flake for a second. Uh, Flake, aka Virtual Guinea Pig. Um, tell us about yourself a, a little bit and how you got involved in VR. Well, uh, I'm I'm Flake. I'm from Calgary, Canada, and uh, you know I'm a good buddy of Kane's, and he ordered a, uh, the DK1 and uh, blew my mind and after that it was sort of done he started uh, developing as you know uh, some, some some horror genre uh, demos and uh, I started checking them out and uh, then it was well let's just do uh, you know a quick uh, playthrough and before you know it, it we just you know kind of ran with it and it's been just absolutely a blast how did you get involved with uh, Riff Max Theater well, you know, as you know, Kane's involved in Riffmax, and and uh, and it was just, you know, we both, you know, were super excited about it, and I've been just watching, you know, you know, obviously Mike's uh, development and Kane's involvement and the changes that have been going on, and you know, I was just lucky that uh, they asked that I help out with some of these events from time to time, and uh, you know, it's been an absolute uh, blast, and I mean, just look at, at this place, it's just such a compelling experience that, you know, for me, you, you know, I'm not a developer, I'm not on the team, but boy, am I a fan. Yeah, absolutely, and I believe you were the um, co-host to the first uh, virtual reality talk show with Reverend uh, Live, uh, Riff Max, Riff Max Live, actually. Um, that was pretty cool. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, it was sort of, uh, it, it kind of came out of nowhere. We were all kind of brainstorming, and before you know it, there was this idea of, you know, having these events and actually doing this stuff. And, you know, I mean, the Riff Max team was coming up with these ideas, and it was just, you know, amazing. And, and I was lucky enough, like I said, to, to be asked to join. And uh, it, it was really a very cool experience, and it was sort of neat from the perspective of, you kind of got to see what it's really like to put on a talk show, uh, you know, script it, work through the ideas, uh, you know, go through, you know, some, you know, bugs and different problems we had and iron them out. And I don't know, we had some great laughs and it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure in the, the future, maybe we'll do another episode or two, but it, it was really cool. And, and it felt pretty cool to be part of something that was, you know, you know pretty groundbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's kind of where it started for me was seeing that show and, and remembering back in Minecraft uh, world uh, where we were doing a, a roundtable kind of prototyping, you know, uh, a VR social situation there. And, and I even remember thinking, oh, let's do a Tonight Show kind of show in Minecraft and we'll build that in Minecraft. But again, all these things were, were not compelling in Minecraft, but those ideas were there. So when 
I heard of the first VR talk show, was totally interested and in, in expressed that, and that's kind of how I got connected uh, with Riffmax here. So uh, we have a similar love for this. Um, one final question. What are your future goals for your uh, YouTube channel? You know, uh, I kind of take it day by day, um, but it, it's more of, you know, I do it out of love, um, and I, I just want to be producing good content, having fun doing it, getting the word out, and uh, hopefully growing the channel. I feel like, um, you know, we're all supporting each other, and, and, and the love has definitely been shown. Um, you know, I never expected to have, you know, you know almost a 1,000 subscribers. I mean, it's just, you know, you know for, for a lot of these big big uh, Let's Players, I mean, those numbers are, are nothing. But, you know, we're just focusing on VR and brand new, and it's just very cool to, to have anybody pay attention. And, and, uh, and like I said, for me, you know, my motivation is all – support the developers because if I can get the word out about what developers are doing they're going to produce more and do more and people are going to back more we're going to have more content and uh, you know that's that's where, where, where I'm coming from great and let's move on to the next story uh, Virtuix Omni further delayed so VR hardware kickstarters uh, are being de uh, delayed uh, first it was stem then we saw Prio VR and now Omni um, what do you guys think of this? I've got a, a, an awesome comment uh, from Doc Ock here, but I'd like to just throw this out to you guys before I read um, that. And let's start with Flake. Well, it, you know, it, it fills me with a lot of sadness, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm hungry for, well, I was hungry for STEM and, and, and then VR coming, uh, Prio VR coming onto the scene. Super stoked about that. Um, you know, it, it's not surprising. This is tough stuff. I mean, and 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 like he was saying, like, I mean, th these these are things that are lagging behind by decades. And you know, I, at a certain point, we have to be patient, hope for the best, and just know and trust that it is going to happen. Not tomorrow, not in a year, but it's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Good point. What are your thoughts, Jake? <laughs> well, I, I work with robots. Um, a lot, as you'll find out later. But and I know that, so I know that working with them, every time you make a prediction, the prediction gets set back by at least a hundred percent, pretty much. So I'm doing research with robots, so I don't have to produce a product, so it's different. But um, I understand why it's taking so long. But yeah, you just have to trust that it will get there, and that it will be much better for having waited. Yeah, that's definitely quality, you know, uh, matters a lot. And these things are toys for a lot of us, and it's not like we need the toy three months earlier. I mean, these this is, shouldn't be thought of as the gaming industry, and we need everything, you know, for the launch of the next Call of Duty. I'm certainly patient, but I really was, you know, I, it, I backed so many of these, you know, decent hardware projects that I'm just chomping at the bit to, to get some of them to play with. Just one of them would have been cool now and it looks like you know all three of them at least those are three that i backed uh, are going to be delayed deep rifter any thoughts on this yeah i uh you know I, i'm not a real tech guy but when i saw the time frames that some of these kickstarters were talking about i was like how in the hell are they going to make you know that just seemed awfully quick to me um that they were going to pull out this amazing stuff in such a short time period so i guess I'm not surprised, and I'm like Jake. I say release it when it's ready to be released. We don't want anything less. Exactly. E, how about your thoughts? Um, I, I kind of agree with that sentiment. Take your time and try to get it to the quality that it needs to be. Um, I, you know, as I said, I think I'm cooler on motion controls than, than most enthusiasts. Um, so, you know, I, I think. Um, it remains to be seen whether they're going to be able to reach like that really satisfying level of quality. Um, if they can, then I think they need to you know wait and actually reach that level. If they can't, if it's just going to be kind of an interesting toy, um, then I think it matters less. And you know maybe it wouldn't hurt to uh, to get it out sooner and sort of um, let people enjoy it for what it is. That's interesting. Um, something like uh, you know the control like stem controllers. Uh, Definitely needs to be fine-tuned, but I could see something like a gun controller. Maybe that they could get that out a little faster. That's not going to be quite as, uh, you know, intricate and, and necessary. Blake, were you chiming in? Well, and who doesn't like, like 
toys. I mean, seriously. I mean, give me some right. effing toys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, it's not really Toys R Us, but, uh, you know, I'm sure these things will be in Toys R Us in many years when this stuff, you know, is out there like all the consoles. But, yeah, I want some toys, too. I want to suit up and then get in inside uh, Rift Max here and, and have a lot more control over this uh, body that you see. Deep Rifter. Oh, no, I was just cheering for you, man. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right, so Doc Ock, he made a few comments here, or a, um, a lengthy comment, uh, and I'm just going to read through that. It says, if the company running the Kickstarter has never previously manufactured hardware, its estimated ship date will be wrong. The, mo the more complex the device, the more wrong the ship date estimate is likely to be. If Kickstarter feedback or stretch goals prompt changes or enhancements to the device, at a minimum of one to two quarters to the expected ship date. If the company hasn't yet proudly shown photos and or video of the finalized prototype, the product will not be in your hands for at least one full quarter, regardless of what the company says. If videos look suspiciously like the device has problems, then the device has problems. Uh, if the creator isn't letting anyone or everyone try the prototype, it doesn't work very well. If the creator isn't pro posting production um, and shipping updates and isn't answering Kickstarter questions about production or shipping, it's not because they are too busy, it's because they know you won't like the honest answer. And a couple more. Note that uh, I say all of this as someone who backed the Omni on Kickstarter. Uh, I've met Jan. I like Jan, but I'm pretty sure that, that uh, six or actually seven of the above all apply to the Omni. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on Doc Ock's uh, thoughts there? I'm sure we all sort of basically agree, but anybody want to expound? E. Um, I think a little bit of cynicism can be healthy, um, but that's what it is. It's, you know, kind of cynicism. Um, and, you know, the, the Omni uh, has been demoing um, to its credit, like at GDC and other trade shows. Um, I, I do think that one um, interesting look or, at that comment that uh, Doc Ock left is that the original Oculus Rift in its Kickstarter um, passed just about all of those tests. And I think that's why... Um, that's one reason why everyone was so excited about it, because it seemed like this might actually be the real deal instead of a bundle of promises. And I'd argue that it was, even though the, the rift itself was delayed. Uh, that's excellent. I didn't, even, I didn't know that, and that's a great point. All right, just find a place in my notes here. Um, and we had a little bit of a crash before. Deep Rifter, did we, did we go through and introduce you or, or not yet? Uh, yeah, I'm Deep Rifter. I'm uh, from the Salt Lake City area, Utah. And uh, my background is actually psychology, uh, which a little a uh, little twist of uh, uh, anthropology as well. So uh, you know, my interest in in VR, uh, besides the experience itself, is uh, the impact it's going to have on individuals, uh, social, uh, on a small scale and a large scale. I am. J it's going to be such an interesting journey on all levels. I like how you put that. You know, it is going to be this journey, and that's definitely how I look at it. It's this. Uh, it's the user experience and the sort of actual experience you get out of this. That's, you know, what I am uh, digging so much. Um, also, uh, um, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce uh, from Kite and Lightning. Who uh, Akrima? Is that his name? He was going to be on the show tonight you and couldn't it. make it because he couldn't. Akrima. Okay. Um, and so you're filling in f uh, for him tonight, and I really appreciate the last-minute notice that we could get you on. Um, one of the cool connections, though, is that you were at the Kite and Lightning party, party out in L.A. a couple weeks ago. Maybe you could tell us about that. I, you wrote in to me about it, and I just was floored. So, yeah, tell us about it. Well, it was amazing. It was held at Troika Studios, and just the uh, interior of this place, the studio is... It's, it's mind-blowing. It's very artistic. I mean, walking down these halls, you've got... Uh, hallways with glass with the servers behind them it's dark you've got green lights red lights they do it in a very artistic way so even just the studio itself is mind-blowing and uh, so we're there and, and the, they've got the Genesis machine and they were up I, uh, from what I heard all night building this thing I mean they looked exhausted and uh, it's this it almost looks like a geodesic dome but just the framework with a bed in the middle of it and you lay down on the bed and uh, they've got uh, the base up underneath the mattresses and everything. And when you put the rift on your head, it's an image of the room that you're in, in the contraption that you're in. So 
for a second there, I was like, wait, wait, do I have the rift on? Yeah, I've got the rift on. Whoa, I'm seeing what I was seeing before I put the rift on. So it already almost immediately gives you the presence and then they crank it. Uh, the soundtrack is amazing. It's almost the closest I can explain. It's like an astral projection <laughs> and you're going through this dream landscape and there's a, a female guide that's guiding you through this landscape and uh, just mind blowing. And uh, so many people there, it, it, I, uh, it was their first time doing VR. Um, and uh, where this machine was set up, there was this big glass window. You could see the, it looked like a big science experiment going on, and you could see the people strapped in there. And people in the line were, you know, getting kind of nervous watching the reactions of these people in there. So I felt it was part of my task to just calm people down. Hey, guys, it's going to be all right. It's VR, you know, explaining what VR is and all of that. So that was awesome. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds so cool. Um, um... Uh, any other guests have any questions about this party, actually? I mean, as you're hearing that. Well, was it a, was it an interactive experience or just like a, a you know, movie-style thing? It, it was passive, uh, you know, and, I, and uh, I finally got my opportunity to play with the HD Rift as well, and they did their opera experience on that. And I, that, that made my night, really. That was my highlight of the night. It was like, oh, wipe the tear from my eye. That was just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it all happened in the rift. Who would know? <laughs> That's very cool. Okay, so let's talk uh, um, about Hollywood bound to jump on board the VR train. This was posted by Superior Vision. Um, the article was by Variety.com. Uh, and legend has it that during the first manned balloon flight in 1783, someone remarked, what good is it? Benjamin Franklin, standing nearby, offered the famous, uh, quote, uh, what good is a newborn baby? Uh, it's a new form of entertainment. Uh, I think that that's very um, exciting, says John Landu, um, Cameron's longtime producing partner. Uh, I use the term discovery. It's a medium where the participant is going on a path of discovery that is of their own choosing. Uh, so this thing makes me think of... Um, you know, just the motion picture uh, history, actually. Uh, if you look at the very beginning of uh, motion pictures, um, people didn't really know what to do with it then. Um, it, it was really until they came up with the idea of editing. Uh, you know, when it first started, nobody knew that you could cut to different places and that the, the human mind would follow it and, and there would be a story. Um, so uh, I think that's really interesting and uh, interesting to talk about, um, you know, film and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to bounce this to Flake. What are your thoughts on, you know, film uh, and VR? Well, it's certainly a natural progression, and really at the end of the day, I mean, even the experience that we're having right now, I mean, it, it, a lot of it is, is all about multimedia. Uh, and, 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 you know, we all want to have these experiences, and I think that it's just bound to go that way. And, of course, right now, this is extremely a hot topic. You know, the Facebook acquisition, you know, Palmer being young and, you know, all of this, th this story, this hype behind it. So it's a natural progression. I mean, what ends up happening, where it actually goes, who knows? But, uh, you know, absolutely no surprise. And Jake, what are your thoughts? Well, the more money going into VR, the happier I am, personally. Um, but I heard in a talk, I think it was the... Los Angeles um, VR meetup. Somebody gave a, a keynote there, and they said that um, quite poignantly that uh, VR is the ultimate platform because it lets you perfectly empathize with whoever wants to wants you to empathize with them. You can be anybody, and they can show you exactly what it's like to be them. And I think movies they try to do that, and so it's an obvious progression. And before I get uh, E's comment, let me read a little more from the article. It says, according to the source uh, within 20th Century Fox, the company is exploring VR marketing and supplemental content for its Night at the Museum and Maze Runner franchises and the Fox Ser Searchlight Reese Witherspoon starred Wild. Uh, and also, VR is clearly a fit for Fox's futuristic or fantasy franchises like X-Men, Fantastic Four, and Avatar. Um, and somebody, uh, Disaffect, commented, How did I miss this news that Fox was working on VR stuff? Great article. Actually had some info that 
and obsessed enthusiasts didn't already know. So did anybody, uh, E, what are your thoughts on the, the film and VR, and did you know that Fox was working on stuff like this? I had no idea about that, and that's actually kind of surprising to me um, if they're jumping into it, you know, feet first. Um, in terms of film and VR in general, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming to this as a game developer, and that's the medium that excites me, you know, to begin with, and maybe it's just because of that and I'm biased, but uh, I feel like games have a lot more potential in VR early on than film do. There are a lot of unsolved problems in film, and I think you're right, it's sort of like, you know, not knowing how to edit. Um, you know, they... They, they need a lot more time, I think, to sort of work that out um, technically, but just as importantly, um, directorially. Uh, any other thoughts on Hollywood film movies? Well, I'm wondering if, if maybe the way to go with this isn't the traditional, uh, you know, uh, shots with a camera, but creating a 3D space, you know, like this, uh, that's high detail, and put the actors in motion camera, uh, you know, in the 3D space rather than the traditional film format. And I guess I kind of got a taste of that when I was out at Kite and Lightning doing the opera and whatnot. That, um, that felt like more of a movie type experience to me with those live actors there. Uh, than the other stuff I've seen uh, in the Rift doing the, the surround movies. That's my opinion. So more like a stage where there's performers. And yeah. that's certainly, yeah, that's up my alley. I mean, that's uh, what I think is very interesting about having the Hydra Hands pre-OVR suit. I, I just, I think uh, I want to see uh, the stuff powered by people, not so much powered by AI that has to be programmed to seem lifelike. I think... Uh, people want to do things and let's all you know put people to work and i think it uh they'd want to collaborate in inside of vr in in kind of that simulated environment dude imagine having those traditional party you know the murder mystery party experience where you've got all the props you're totally in character that would be cool i imagine riff max would love to do um uh i just blanked on it um rocky horror picture show that would be ultimate right? <laughs> Well, in fact, I know that there's been talks by the Rift Max team before about putting on, you know, things like plays and being able to, you know, play even multiple characters and play it back and, and be able to loop yourself back in and, you know, become a part and maybe, you know, uh, see something that's pre-recorded and then give it your own twist and collaborate and, you know, build. Uh, I think the sky's the limit. It's going to be really, really cool. And I know these guys are definitely, uh, you know, it's on, it's on their minds. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Well, it's Sounds interesting. Like uh, you, know, I, you, know, you know, this goes into the realm of psychology as well, you know, um, role playing uh, in, 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 uh, when, you're, when you're doing your uh, craft with, with clients, you know, being able to actually role play scenarios, be in the scenario and work through those things, you know, awesome stuff. So next thing I want to do is go into uh, asking uh, Jake in the margin all about himself, uh, about the research that you're doing. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and anything you want to talk about. Uh, so I, I'm 22 years old. I live in Newcastle, Australia. And I, last year I finished my undergrad degree in mathematics and physics. And um, I majored in pure maths and theoretical physics quantum mechanics mainly, um, and I sort of looked around at the research that was going on and nothing in our university really interested me. So I went over to the computer science department and um, started talking to them and I ended up joining the university's RoboCup team. So RoboCup is a <coughs> an international robo robot soccer competition. So we program humanoid robots, they're about yay high. Uh, and they play soccer autonomously. And I'm actually sitting in the lab right now um, with a small soccer field behind me. Um, so this year we're going to present <laughs> that. Cool. Super um, cool. Um, so um, the robots there were playing autonomous soccer, and we programmed them to do that. But once you put them on the ground, um, they start up, and then you can't touch them for the entire game unless they break down. So that was our qualification video. We have to send that video to the RoboCup committee every year. Uh, to prove that we have the skills to actually compete. And this year we were accepted and we're going to Brazil. So how that relates to VR is I'm working on robotics problems and then I ordered my DK2 last year. Um, 
I didn't kickstart it. I pre-ordered like um, shortly before it, all, the, all the shipping happened um, or started happening, and I fell in love with VR at that point. And when I started looking at how everything works, it turns out all the maths and all the all the techniques in robotics and VR they transfer really well. So now I'm hoping to so now I'm doing research in VR, looking at eye tracking using um, electrooculography, which is measuring the potential across the eye. Um, and I'm hoping to go into a PhD doing something with haptics. So hopefully, I want to build, my dream is to build an exoskeleton, which is pretty far-fetched, but it, it's still an interesting research topic. Very interesting. Um, and what have you learned from the Oculus community um, and the VR demos that have come out over the past year? Um, do you have any favorites? What I've learned is that um, presence is incredibly powerful, and that's that's what makes it so interesting. Um, and I have to honestly say, my favorite demo is the Riftmax Theater because it does it's giving me a glimpse into the social. Um, right, right. Well, you only find fans here, so excellent. Yeah. Um, all right, another topic uh, I wanted to run past you guys is uh, what do you think um, about um, Let's Players on YouTube and Twitch and uh, all this VR streaming stuff? It's, it, this is all good stuff, right? Um, Blake, you stream a lot of stuff on YouTube. What do you think a about this stuff? I'm sure you like the more the merrier, right? Absolutely, I, I love I love content, and I love really good you know people that that you know spend the time and put in the time to create really good content. But for me, it, it, it's all great. I mean, I'm I'm just having fun, and it's all about embracing, supporting developers, and uh, you know just spreading the the VR love. And that's that's at least where where, where I'm coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there any kind of uh, reason why the Let's Play wouldn't? you know, isn't good for VR? I, I really can't imagine, but I'm curious. Not, I mean, you know, from, from my perspective, absolutely not. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, like I said, the more exposure, the, the better. And especially, I mean, we have to keep in mind that despite all the news, the majority of people you meet day to day have never heard of an Oculus. So it's just the fact, uh, and, and the more that we can, you know, get the word out about how amazing this experience is, uh, you know, the better. And the more we support our developers, the the better. And uh, you know, that that's been my position all along. That that makes me think of a potential like issue. Is a lot of times we'll stream in you know Rift View and you know, uh, um, you know two two screens, seeing both eyes, uh, eye holes, and that could maybe be off-putting to somebody that's new, you know, they, they wouldn't like that, they don't understand why that is, and also then that just uh, brings the question of you really can't understand these things, right, unless you've experienced them, so those are a couple thoughts that come to my mind. Anybody have thoughts on this? Well, it was definitely my introduction into VR, you know, watching Cymatic Bruce, uh, that's what got me into this. I was, you know, I've always been in a VR aficionado, but watching Bruce with this new technology, that's what sold me on it and made me order my first DK1. I think there's a lot of people just waiting for CV1 because of uh, these videos out there. I guess that's the Good point. point. You can't really, can't really understand what it's like, so you need a proxy there and the YouTube community kind of plays that role, telling you how good it is. Good answers. All right, uh, we're going to be wrapping up things here in a moment. I do want to ask the audience if they would like to um, ask any questions, that there's uh, two microphones on each side of the room. Um, and while people are lining up for that, uh, I wanted to ask Kane if he could read out the uh, hitbox results. Would you buy a Samsung HMD? Yeah, kind of surprising. We had 54% say no. Close second was huh at 25%. And then yes at 20%. Huh. Yeah, huh's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. And on my left here, we have somebody that would like to ask a question. Could you state your name and your question? Oh, this is Von Pelty. And it's like a Von comment Pelty. and a question. Uh, it's more towards Z because I really love the Darknet demo. And I was wondering, I noticed you you don't, you don't have a Kickstarter like Technolust. And so I was wondering, 
how is money affecting your development? Do you have any secret backers, or how, how do you how how are you working on your game? Because I heard I think you're doing it out of your own love for it. Yeah, I um I have sort of two secrets to my style of development. One of them is make a really cheap game. So you know, Darknet is in part designed to be something that's very easy, you know, for someone like me to develop. It doesn't require a whole lot of um, you know, 3D art or, you know, assets or anything like that. Um, it's simple enough, hopefully, that, you know, I as one programmer could finish the whole thing, etc. cetera. Uh, and the other part of it is um, I had saved up some money beforehand. So, you know, I mentioned I'd, um, I went ND about a year and a half ago. Um, when I did that, I did so with uh, savings that would last me about three years of living very cheaply. And the idea there is, you know, then I can sort of go take on these crazy projects like Darknet that are sort of, you know, risky projects for risky platforms. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I need the time, I think, more than I, I need any extra money. And so Kickstarter, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable asking people for that money. And I, uh, I, I don't think I ultimately need it. Thanks. Great question. You, so you're proactive. You actually, you know, saved your money up. Smart. Well, I was very lucky, you know, to be able to do so for a bunch sure. of reasons. But yeah, that was a, a a good path for me to take. And I don't see anybody else lined up for questions, so I think that's basically going to wrap things up. Uh, Guest, do you have anything to plug specifically? You want to point anybody, even if it's not your own project, point somebody somewhere. I just I want to just plug give a lot of people some awesome experiences on the rift I've just been having a blast having VR parties at my house introducing people that haven't tried it yet getting the word out there getting the com local communities in your area excited about VR love it man spread the word I think I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, plug darknet so darknetgame.com and there's a link um, to my dedicated subreddit. So if you came here from uh, our Oculus, you should check out the Reddit link on um, my website, on Darknet's website. And yeah, subscribe, and that's where I'll post all my stuff. Excellent. Blake, Jake? Well, uh, again, I would be remiss if I didn't plug the uh, Virtual Reality Guinea Pig on YouTube, where you will find Let's Play, and also everything Rift Max, the uh, Virtually Incorrect, this show, I mean, karaoke, everything's going on. Check it out. Make sure you subscribe. Show your love. Please do, folks. It really does help, and uh, we want to keep this going and, and uh, keep bringing good content. So, uh, And also... So reach out to me uh, if you're interested in being a guest or in the audience. Uh, Reddit or Twitter at Gunter444. And that's it. See you next time on Virtually Incorrect. It's been a pleasure being your host tonight. Thanks to all my guests, audience members, the Rift Max crew, the authors and commenters of the stories presented, and finally to the whole damn VR community. You guys rock.